as you can see, it's a very uh, a very controversial topic. Uh, there's lots of different perspectives, both around the estimation and and what actually causal in inference is. Um, so I th it's going to be, I think, a lot of fun to to have a, a panel. Uh, the panel consists of the three speakers you've seen uh, already. So um, uh, Larry Wasserman, who opened with uh, telling us about estimation problems of Bayesian causal inference. Um, with um, uh, Philip David telling us that Bayesian decision theory was all you need and Finn taking a sort of different perspective of, of relationships between causal uh, graphical models or the Perlian approach and the Bayesian approach. We uh, um, had many questions from uh, Carlos, who's uh, Carlos Cincinnati, I apologize for mispronunciation, who's a uh, working at UCLA on, on causal Perlian style causal models. And clearly he's bringing this very Perlianist perspective. And I'm thrilled uh, John Langford has just joined us. Hopefully your mics can work, works as well. Uh, please say hello, John. Should work. Um, okay, good to see you. Uh, uh, again, if you, if you, we'd love to see you if you don't mind, if you're not in your pajamas or on your bed or something, um, I think it'll make it more fun for the audience. Um, so maybe I think the first thing to kind of kick off in is, is do we need for, for doing, oh, actually, I think it'd be great for you to introduce yourself, maybe tell you where you sit on the Bayesian, non-Bayesian spectrum um, uh, and, and the type of contribution you do. Jo John needs no introduction. I should have, should have given him a quick introduction. He's got, he's a tech sector veteran and, and now working at a very senior role in Microsoft, but he's, uh, actually deployed the type of propensity score estimators or contextual bandits in production and also done a, a lot of frequentist theory on them. So I expect he'll be on the, on the you don't need Bayes for causality side, but it's always nice to be surprised. Um, would, you, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, John? And tell me where I got you wrong. Um, I guess I don't know what, how much to add. Um, there is, okay, so I've worked a lot on contextual bandits, which I think is partly why I'm here. And in contextual bandits, you have a situation where you're, you're seeing rewards, you're uh, taking actions, you're, you're seeing context. So it's like context, you see a context, you take an action, you get a reward, you try to improve the policy over and over and over again, right? And uh, I, I've worked on this from a theory perspective. I've worked on this from an implementation perspective. There's a, some code that's open source to Vocal Wabbit, which has a bunch of the algorithms for this which is uh, pretty heavily used. And then I've convinced Microsoft to actually create a product around this, which is the cognitive services personalizer. And so that's getting used so that you can go get your own little learning loop and start uh, learning based upon this. So I've, I guess I've seen a number of different things in terms of what's necessary to make things work. And uh, on the, on the Bayesian versus um, frequentist perspective, I guess I would, I would mostly call myself a frequentist. I would say that there are often good intuitions that you get from thinking about a Bayesian perspective that have, are actually quite relevant and useful. Okay, and uh, you heavily use the, the, the Horowitz Thompson estimator that, that, that uh, Larry Wasserman talked about uh, earlier today. Um, and it's, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> well, then, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a huge phase change because um, you, you switch from a mode where people deploy things in A-B tests for two weeks to see if they work to, you know, you run things offline and in like a minute you get an answer. Okay. okay. So it makes an enormous difference in practice. So you, you mean like online testing? You're saying? So you, you can have a recorded data set where you know the, the probability of what you chose individual actions. And using that recorded data set, you can test individual policies offline very rapidly. Instead, you can, uh, which was, so the, the standard before we started doing this was, uh, you know, you, you create an A-B test. So it's like a clinical trial where, uh, you know, you, you try your new thing and you wait for two weeks to see if the data suggests that your new thing is better than the old thing. Okay. Um, uh, maybe we should move on to, Philip, do you want to, again, you've, you've already, I think, outlined your perspective, but maybe uh, say hello and again, and uh, uh, your, your Bayes, non-Bayes position on, on causal inference. Right, well, um, 
Again, if, if people would like to turn their cameras on, I think it'll make, make it more fun. Uh, but uh, I think my, my camera should be all right. Um, I'm not I think you mean the audience, right? For the audience. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right, well, I mean, I, 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 we've had two different, uh, well, we, we had uh, three talks, and I think two different aspects of what it is to be Bayesian. Um, so uh, Larry and Finn were particularly concerned with problems of estimation uh, from very different points of view. Um, and the pros and cons of doing that the Bayesian way and causal problems. Um, and there's a completely different aspect of being a Bayesian, which is what I was concerned with in my talk, which is to do with how you make decisions in terms of thinking. Um, being a Bayesian involves assessing subjective epistemic uncertainty about future worlds and thinking about what to do on the basis of how your action might change um, the distribution over, over future worlds. So, so that's being a Bayesian because uh, we're, uh, it, it's, it's a very subjective approach essentially, uh, but we can make it less subjective by introducing data. Um, that brings us back to estimation, but I rather cheekily uh, short-circuited that by assuming we had so much data that estimation wasn't gonna be a problem. There's a bit like what Pearl does, actually. Uh, but it, but it was, it, was yeah, it yeah, exactly. I mean, Pearl, Pearl, Pearl never does estimation. He's he, 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 so I, I, I'm with Pearl in saying let's restrict ourselves to cases where we don't have any uncertainty about probabilities. But was it so different to Finn, where you sort of had this switch that sort of said which world you're in and started to talk about these types of issues, where she had the the two the two uh, diagrams and the, the parameters branching between them. Was it actually so different? Was it? Was they? No, not... I don't think it's different at all. I think. I think. I mean, I think. I, I, I think there's a lot of commonality between what Finn was doing, and what I was doing, uh, except Finn was taking very seriously the, the the possibility of not having vast amounts of data, and wondering about how you make use of the data you have got from a Bayesian point of view. Okay. Am uh, I right, Finn? I mean, did I did I misinterpret yeah, you there? I, I mean, I think. Um... I think both components, I, I, I would say I'm not really a Bayesian either. <laughs> um, I guess the, what, what I was trying to, to show is that you absolutely can represent this uh, purely in terms of thinking about models of inference, which I think is the same as what you did with the decision node. I just made a more, a bigger representation of that where you explicitly draw both of those systems and what the connections are between them. Um, and yes, I am in, interested in inference with finite data because that's usually all I've got. Uh, uh, Larry, do you want to jump in? What's your Bayes non Bayes in the world of causality position uh, if we can't guess already? Yeah, well, you know, I kind of like the way Carlos was expressing. I'd say that's how I think about it, which is I do think of it as it's very useful to say I have data from a distribution. I have a causal question. Task one for me is, can I express the causal question as a functional of the distribution P? I think that's just, to me, completely separate from inference. In fact, that's what Phil was doing in, his, in a particular, uh, in the language of decision theory. So I think to me, step one is clearly write down the causal question as a functional of the distribution independent of how I'm gonna do inf inference. That's just a, to me a separate question. And, and that first step can be very tricky. If you have com complicated situations, it might take you know, some work to figure it out. And this is the part obviously that Judah focuses on too, is how do you write a formula for, by the way, historical note, let's keep in mind that all the graphical stuff started with uh, Peter Spirti's Richard Schein. CMU, yeah. Uh, yes, and we tend to, uh, I know uh, Judah has been a, a strong promoter of it, but I. I I hate to see people historically forget the importance of their work. Anyway, um, so, and then the identification question is, I think also important, which is, is that functional, a functional only of the distribution of the observables or not? And just knowing that seems to me actually quite important. And I think, um, that's, okay, so if I maybe don't rephrase, what, what's non-basing about this, you're not writing a likelihood function, you're- No, you're we haven't got it. 
No, we haven't got to inference yet. See, that's the thing. I want to divorce. Yeah, yeah. This is a math question to me. It's got nothing to do with it's statistics. deduction. It's just it's like yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a math question. It's what is the formula for the causal effect? But how how do I express it as a function of the distribution? Once I've done that, now I can ask the question: How am I going to estimate it? And if I can estimate that for days. I can estimate it with frequentist inference. But I do think it's important to separate writing the causal effect as a um, functional and then talk separately about how you're going to do the inference. And in between those two things, I guess I would throw in what's the optimal, as, you know, what, what, what's the minimax uh, risk? What's the best I can estimate that at? How do, what's the semi-parametric efficiency? There's all kinds of questions in between writing down the functional and deciding how you're going to do the uh, inference. But I do think, uh, you know, and I agree with what Carlos is saying, which is separating and so he called it identification. I guess I would almost just, just to, so we don't confuse, you know, get caught up in terminology, calling it uh, deriving formula, <laughs> deriving a formula. Oh, let's call it causal, causal analysis. Well, <laughs> yeah, causal uh, interest. I don't yeah, ca I don't know, causal uh, math or something as opposed to statistics, but just writing a formula for the causal effect, um, you know, the G formula, for example, is just itself a very important part, part of the process. And it can be very complicated. I'll, I'll just cite as an example of for, uh, that I think is really interesting is there's a recent work by Eric uh, check and check in at Wharton called proximal uh, learning, where he using a sets of negative controls, he was able to rewrite the G formula, the functional for the causal effect completely as a functional of the observed distribution, even when there's unobserved confounding. And, and it's not trivial how to do that. I mean, it takes a lot of you know, uh, mathematical reasoning. That's completely independent of inference. That's just a math question. It's given the following distribution with the following properties, it's a complete surprise that even though there's unobserved confounders that I can write uh, in, that, in the setting he's dealing with, that I can write the causal quantity strictly as some functional of the, of the distribution of the observed data. Then again, you can say, okay, now how do I want to estimate that? Functional is a totally separate question. Okay, uh, it sounds like it's similar to some of the Perlian results of like front door rule, et cetera. That yeah, that's another, if I can make another historical remark, um, you know, and not to, to belittle Pearl's work, which is immensely important on the, uh, uh, He's a friend, a big fan of his stuff. But remember, all those formulas go back to the G formula that was written down by Jane Robbins in 1988 before anybody had ever thought about these things. So I just, it's, it's, I just want to make that historical okay. remark. That's a, a listen to a lot of us, I guess. Uh, uh, Phil, do you have anything to weigh in on this? You, you, I mean, I, I know your talk didn't address it, but you're happy with this formulation of. I, like it, if I'm going to rephrase, you, you, you've, got a, you've got data, you model the joint of that data, and then you transform it uh, or, you, or you marginalize it to some causal thing you're interested in. And it's, doesn't, there's no likelihood it doesn't look like Bayes at all. Are you happy with this? Is that? Um, I mean, what Larry's saying, I think, is what I was saying too, which is that there's a complete separation between uh, what you do with uh, problems where you have complete knowledge of the probabilities and how you do causal math, as you called it, uh, and, and understand what you can compute from what. Uh, that, that is uh, something which uh, is pretty much independent of your philosophical point of view, except for one point, important fact, which I think should never be forgotten, which is all of that will depend on your assumptions about how observational data and interventional data are related. And if you draw uh, what I might call a Perlian dag, there's a lot of hidden assumptions there about, about those relationships. And uh, it's all too easy to forget about those assumptions and take them for granted when perhaps they aren't actually so. But once you assume that you can make those assumptions, then you do the math, that's fine. There's no inference involved. Uh, and then having done all that, we come to the separate question of how am I gonna find out about those things on the basis of data? Um, am I, are you being a, a completely boring Bayesian here? I, I feel like this separation is stepping outside the, the framework a little bit. It could be that, um, you, I mean, you're not really like, you're not, 
I see it. The separation is logical, David. It's it's like a log logically distinct tasks. Yeah. It's it's like it's not like a, a philosophical question. One is you so I, try and identify what question you want to answer. That's state one. That's that's what we've been talking about a lot of the time. Um, and then you say, well, how am I going to answer it? What am I going to do? There's that's a lot of agreement on the panel tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. All right. Fair enough. I. Uh, it seems uh, perhaps it is a boring Bayesian position also. There, there are, there are these, these steps separate. Uh, John, I know it's not necessarily your your issue, but I don't know if you want to weigh in on it at all. So uh, I would say that there's, uh, I mostly have not worked with observational causality. I've mostly worked with interventional causality. And when you're in, with intervention, if you're working with interventional causality, suddenly things are easy in a much more substantial way than they are with observational causality. Um, so what I mean by interventional is, is you know, you're, you're directly intervening in the system and you're doing the experiments and trying to use that information to figure out what to do in a, in a much more direct fashion than if you just get a bunch of data and you're trying to figure out what the causal structure is inside that data. I would say that um, these are obviously related because they're, they're both dealing with causality. And uh, the way to use one to assist the other is not entirely clear to me yet. Okay, interesting. I, I, maybe I can just throw in like a, a sub question to that because I, it comes up in, in my work a lot. Do you think worrying about unobserved confounding is something that people that are running say a recommended system or some big production system is, should you be worrying about that kind of thing? I think in general, the answer is yes. So, and, but there's several different levels of worry, right? So there's the, I have no recorded experiments in my data. Uh, and so I really don't even, it, it's hard to infer anything about making some fairly strong assumptions. Uh, but there's, there's that level, which, which you see fairly often in the wild. And then there's a level where you have some recorded experiments and now you wonder about things beyond this, right? So maybe, uh, you know, users come back to a website and what they saw before affects what they do the next time, right? So th these are, um, confounding elements that uh, could matter, but um, yeah. maybe, maybe the concerns that you have once you're doing some sort of interventional causality are substantially reduced. I, I mean that I imagine you're, when you're doing A-B testing, you're running experiments. Yeah. Do you need to worry about unobserved confounding? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And in, in, in general, yes. Um, so, uh, one thing which can happen is um, you have an A-B test going on and uh, people who are coming back are switching between A and B, right? And maybe that has a lot of effects that wouldn't happen if you're purely in A or purely in B. Usually when you're doing A-B tests, you actually try to segregate users into the A or the B. But then the fact that, that other people are getting B while they're getting A can also matter at times, right? So if you if you have any kind of social network type structure, then segregating the A and the B across the social network uh, is a little problematic, right? So there's, there's a boundary and um, that can cause confounding effects, which would uh, screw up your inferences about what would happen if you switch to either all A or all B. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, I and mean, if you don't implement it properly, I, I think that, uh, it, that, of course, that, that makes sense. Um, cool. Um, so I think we wandered around a little bit more than I expected. Maybe we should, in terms of causal inference, what, what is it that's distinct for it? Is it just inference? It feels like it's, it's um, potentially confusing people to use this term. I think everyone's often a bit scared of it. Could we not come up with a theory of inference that covers everything, Carlos? You, I think you've got a, an opinion on this. Oh, so uh, uh, causal inference, as causal theorists usually define, is is so inference is always from something uh, we have to something we don't have, right? So, for example, the statistical inference is I have a sample and I'm making inferences about the distribution. Uh, so the, 
Now let's forget about the samples. Let's suppose we have infinite data. So we don't have statistical inference to worry about anymore. Now the causal inference part is I'm making inferences across distributions, right? So I have an interventional distribution. Uh, maybe I have two interventional distributions and I wanna make inference about a third, like I have experiment on A, experiment on B, wanna make it an inference about experimenting on A and B together. Um, variables, not a status. And then, so the causal inference part is, it's all we develop for making this cross distribution uh, logical deductions, right? So it's different. I, would, I wouldn't say this is Bayesian inference because if you say that, then deduction is Bayesian inference, right? Like, and, and then everything is Bayesian inference almost. So if I'm deriving some bounds or if I'm deriving, uh, uh, a functional for the for the that identifies the causal effect. That's part of causal inference, right? Like I'm saying to you, this causal effect is identified. Well, first I need to define the causal effect. To define the causal effect, I need a causal model, right? So we need the concept of a causal model, either uh, uh, with the do or the structural model or the counterfactuals or the forcing nodes. So, so we need we need something that my target quantity is a functional of that something, right? So in counterfactual, my target quantity is a functional of the of the marginal distribution, for example, of the potential outcome. Uh, or in the structural model, my functional is I'm going to take the structural model, wipe one equation, like you do in in your in your like exactly what you do, right, in their graphical model, and I'm going to infer the distribution on 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 that interventional model. And now my question is, for example, uh, what do I want to know about the, the causal model? What is the data that, that I have? And then I need to describe that data. Uh, do I have the interventional data? Do I have observational data? From what regime the data is? And, and what do I know about the model? And what do I know is our constraints on the causal model, right? And then I'm, I'm gonna ask all sorts of logical questions about this. So can I get what I want from what I have? Uh, that's one question. Uh, can I bound what I want from what I have? If so, can I get a closed form expression? Does that entail any testable implications? So I would say that all, all these parts are the causal inference part, right? Okay. Uh, which you can uh, do within a Bayesian framework. It's fully compatible with a Bayesian framework. But the separation is, is, is necessary. So, but is this anything more than terminology? Like, if in, do you, what's your take? Is this, is this an important distinction or is it terminology? So I think it is terminology. Um, I guess my view of statistics is that it is broader than just having a sample and wanting to understand the distribution of that. So um, let's take a problem where you wouldn't generally consider it a causal problem. Let's say I want to learn something about, you know, the Planck constant, the fundamental constant of the universe. And I've got a bunch of data that I've observed uh, then in order to do that, I'm going to have to define some kind of model that connects my observation to the Planck constant. So that's going to be some physics model that connects those things. And then I'm going to uh, do, and, and that's writing the functional. So that's writing a functional. Or but but the say, physics part, do you say it's part of statistics? The, the yeah, physics? it's modeling. It's modeling. Yep. No, but... but, but it's but it's, uh, it's I mean, uh, using uh, physics right it's not it's yeah, not it's a statistical physics. model it's a physical model i mean it's a it's a statistical model that contains both physics and random variables so it's a statistical model no i mean um, it is a statistical model in the sense of of but this is just variation. Like, at this point it's just language right so i would incorporate i, I would say this is the process of model uh, no but but the, the, the the key question is how would you write down this physical model, right? Like what types of assumptions do you make on the physical model? How do you how do you derive the logical implications of the physical model? Well, in this so case, that's what the, the physicists model, do. I would use physics because I am. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's the same thing. Right? Philip, to you, is this, is this a meaningful distinction? Is it so like where, why draw the line and where draw the line? And um, and it seemed to me you were actually advocating this separation as the causal inference is different to to in general inference, you, what's your, if you're there, Philip? Oh, sorry, uh, 
I am here, but I didn't think your question was addressed to me. Apologies. No problem. Um, I mean, I, I, I think we a, a fascinating discussion which uh, about terminology, which I don't think has really been about causality. That, that's um, yeah. Uh, you know what's what you call things. Uh, yeah, we can each have a. But I was surprised to see you, 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 you kind of disagree. You kind of agreed with Larry and Carlos. I, I think that. You don't need to write it in likelihood function seems to be the implication that you just need to estimate a density, a density and that the transform of that density is the important thing. Um, oh, wait, it's not, it's, we're not saying that likelihood is important, but it's, a, it's important for the other step, just to clarify. Oh, I mean, uh, right, but it, it and, and maybe to clarify, it, it's, it, and, and it connects to Larry's points about this, this old controversy about whether you condition on everything, whether you condition on everything, which is, Bayesian doctrine comes from this this kind of if you, this joint model and as, as Finn shows you like you can you can condition everything get the right answer it's fine but then you perhaps it's a terminology thing again a different type of terminology but what, what's your resolution to it Philip? I mean I think we've, we've heard this before right? that uh, there are the two completely uh, different but often confused questions about what are you doing the conditioning for are you doing the conditioning in terms of a completely well-specified probability distribution in order to uh, discover a suitable formula, which you can then try and target? Or are you doing conditional inference? Uh, in which case, uh, if you're a Bayesian, you're always conditioning on all the data. Why would you not? Okay, but may maybe the, the important point is, is the thing that tells you between the, the, the old system and the new system that the, the information between this, is this a joint density or and you just simply use probabilistic rules or where do these like non-probabilistic rules arise from? If it, 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 I mean, is that, is that valid because it's a different type of inference or what's going on there? When you say non-probabilistic rules, I'm not sure what, what you mean. Well, I mean, the rules for, say, the, the front door rule, et cetera, they're strange, to say the least. It's like you're, it looks like- well, it may be strange, but it's certainly, it's certainly probabilistic. I yeah. mean, it's maths. I mean, as, as, as Larry says, it's, it's it, it may be strange, it may be unexpected, but it's, it's what the math gives you. Yeah, um, if, if I could make a, an analogy, if, suppose you wanted to estimate the kurtosis of a distribution. Well, the first thing I have to do is write down what's the formula for the Cardoza. I, don't, I can't remember, so I have to figure it out. That's got nothing to do with Bayes or non-Bayes or likelihoods. I'm just going to get a formula. Now, when I have the formula for the kurtosis, I can say, okay, how am I going to estimate it? And maybe I'll use Bayes or non-Bayes or something like that. So, uh, you know, I think that's just a useful separation of tasks. Okay. Um... So I'd agree this is totally valid. I mean, perhaps where things get confusing is that if you are Bayesian and- You always get an down, answer. <laughs> well, no, if you're Bayesian, right, the likelihood is it's, it's the P of data given some parameters, right? And in order to write down a likelihood implicitly there, you've got to have some model that connects your data to your parameters. And so from that perspective, modeling is part of the Bayesian process because you've done it when you wrote down your likelihood. Well, you sure can't do Bayesian inference unless you've done that. Whether it's part of Bayesian inference is another matter. Well, but let me but drop you do, something here. You can't here. do much frequentist inference unless you've done that either. So one thing that I, I think causal inference is gonna to bring to Bayesian inference more and more, maybe, maybe it already brings, is instead of worrying about modeling the full generative model, you're, you can be free to model the joint distribution because you know what to target for, right? For your Bayesian uh, inference. Because like you said, you can, only obtain, you can only sample directly from the interventional distribution. If you write down the, uh, the fully generative model, like you need to put the latent variable there, you need to put everything because literally you're computing the interventional distribution, right? Because for any instantiation of the, of the, of the priors, you have a, a fully specified model. So you can sample from the, from the interventional. Uh, so I don't know if it's, but one thing that can happen more is like, well, maybe I don't want to worry about latent variables. I just want to model the, the observed data. 
and then I target the functional. I, I, I guess that can happen, start going to happen more in, in Bayesian inference. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Yep. Yeah. Let, let, maybe I'll just add uh, an example of that, which is I wrote a paper uh, a few months ago with my colleagues about uh, causal inference for some COVID stuff. And it involved time varying treatments and time varying outcomes and so on. It's the, it's the, Phil referred to that in his uh, talk. Um, and writing down the joint distribution and uh, for the whole process is a nightmare. And we don't even think we can do it. But we wrote down a formula for the causal effect. And we model that directly using something called the marginal structural model, which is you model the functional, not the, not the joint distribution. And then that's really easily estimated with an estimating equation approach. And then, and so that's how we estimated the causal effect. We explicitly aren't using uh, a likelihood. In fact, we're explicitly avoiding ever writing down the joint distribution because we don't even think we can uh, model it very well. Uh, so. Would it this be to a violation of conditionality to a Bayesian though? Is, uh, yeah, I'm sure it would, but I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> Philip, do you care? Would that, does it bother you? Um, yeah, maybe it does a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I am bothered by the, the, the problems that it seems that uh, the, the wonderful Bayesian approach does, does get a little bit stuck in the mud and cause all problems like this. Do you have intuition why it might? Or like, is it something specific about these types of problems? Or I think the answer is no. I'm completely puzzled. Oh, well. It's, uh, Do you well, have intuition? Well, 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 well uh, uh, there is actually one recent result that completely solves causal inference for uh, for sounds like we need to know it uh, uh, discrete variable models. So if you have discrete variable models, and maybe that's a question for Philip too, because this this result was derived assuming that the potential outcomes exist, and doing that. Uh, so so if you have discrete discrete variables, even though the latent variable can be arbitrarily complex. We can always divide the individuals in response types because there is only so many uh, ways the, the latent variables can, can change the outcome, right? It can only flip your, for example, if it's a binary outcome, it can only flip you to one or to zero and whatever. So, so th this is a paper of, uh, from the group of Elias Baron Boyne. Uh, it's called, let me recover, Partial Identification of Counterfactual Distributions. So what they do is they take uh, a, a causal graphical model with discrete variables, and then they, they do this canonical partition of the latent space, and then they put uh, uh, uninformative priors on this latent space, right? Because now it's a discrete latent space. Is it informative or uninformative? Uninformative priors. And then what they do is, yeah, and then what they do is now you can just use sampling, Bayesian sampling to get, uh, all the identification and bounds of anything, right? Because you're not imposing any additional structure. So that would be non parametric. Well, you're, 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 you're putting a prior distribution on something which you don't really understand. So how are you going to do that? Yeah, so in that case, they are pragmatic. They are doing this to obtain, to actually estimate the bounds, right? To, so they sampled and they get the mean and the max. Uh, and then eventually this oh, will convert okay. to well, the, well, for yeah. sure, that, for, for, if they're getting bounds, for sure, that doesn't require that they do it that particular way. I'm, yeah. I mean, I know so what they do. I can't comment too much without seeing the paper, but, uh, but um, I can't believe that those bounds depend on doing it their way. Those are bounds which will come out of any sensible way of approaching the problem. Yeah, but it's a complete solution in the sense that you can get numerically any bound um, for, for any query you would imagine, for example, the dues, the, the intervention queries or counterfactual queries, uh, as so, long as it's the discrete variable model. So explain, <laughs> explain, what, the, explain what the prior, dis what prior distribution has got to do with getting bounds. Oh, as long as you don't constrain the observed data, uh, then you, you can get the bound. Uh, it's gonna convert oh. to the bound, right? Yeah, the the the, bounds, the target the bounds, the bounds can't be dependent on the, on a prior distribution. I mean, there must they must there must be something which uh, the very nature of bounds is that they're the best and worst under all possible ways things could be. So yeah, but it's gonna bounds, have the sup the support, right? The you can the, the bound is gonna be the support of the the posterior. 
like uh, not the shape. I'm not talking about the shape, but the the limits. Well, it, okay, it may be a great paper. It's still sound to me. I think, quite I odd. think we should make an effort to share the paper on the, on the site or something. It's, oh it's, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, no. so that's in the. You could put informative uh, priors, for example, uh, in your case, and then you would have uh, uh, um, a Bayesian inference. But you're going to put priors on the counterfactual quantities, which is maybe I don't know. Well, I, I don't know this paper, but many many years ago there was uh, work by uh, by Pearl on uh, on bounds in the the case of incomplete compliance problems. Um, which involved uh, very strong counterfactual reasoning. And I was able to derive the same bounds without any counterfactual reasoning. In fact, slightly, slightly uh, refined bounds. Can I maybe take it back to something I think unifies maybe two of the topics we've been throwing around, which is, is like the conditionality principle, which is like Bayesian's whole deal, but I'm not even sure any of us are completely willing to, to defend. So, so the, you know, the, the experiment and forming the experiments that were not performed are not relevant. So it means, I think, two things like in the in these types of problems, we're talking about these sort of ex, 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 uh, non experimental data is that that uh, it, it's potentially a, a, an issue here of like whether you do any kind of a marginalization or whether you do so, some sort of more modeling here. And also, of course, in the propensity score, which of course will violate conditionality. Um, so does it, it seems to me that this, it, it, it does reduce and recommend the systems to things like clicks divided by expected impressions. Uh, John, is that a fair characterization of what the IPS estimator will do? That is it, um, and that to me makes it sound silly that it's, when I know the actual impressions, why am I divided by the expected impressions so as, the, as the IPS score is? So the, the exact form of estimators that you want to use is actually, there's a, a lot of different uh, versions of this. There's this simple Horvitz-Thompson where you're kind of uh, sort of estimating expected clicks over uh, impressions. But- I, I think uh, it's the opposite. It's actual clicks divided by expected impressions. Yeah, so clicks over impressions, yes. right? Um, is the self-normalized IPS SNPs, where you're um, you're trying to stabilize things uh, a little bit. There's also um, some empirical likelihood based estimators and confidence intervals that we worked on recently that I guess I'm pretty enthusiastic about because having the confidence intervals there is, is uh, extremely helpful um, compared to kind of other approaches to getting confidence intervals. Um, the, uh, I think that the, all the formalism is more robust than just a binary signal. But, but, it's I mean, not like your, your reward needs to be click or not. It, it, it could, and, and often in practice, we, we're using things which are, uh, more complex than binary signals. I think, I think the binary signal is sort of a default, but it's very easy and doable to do more complex things. If we stick to that example, though, naively, like, why is, why is it better to use expected impressions when I know the impressions? Uh, maybe I don't quite understand what you mean by expected impressions, because so you I don't know exactly what your actual impressions are. Exactly. Right? And so so you, have, you have your actual impressions, and then you have your observed clicks when some policy happens to agree with the data gathering policy. And that's how you form your, your IPS estimate. Um, so, so when you say expected impressions, what do you mean? I mean, as you, like, as you, as you look at the logging policy and as you sum, you, you, you take samples of the context and you sum, sum over this, you'll know typically on these contexts, you would have done this recommendation, this action, this number of times. Uh, but in fact, you know exactly how many times you did that action. Um, so why, why use, I mean, maybe you're, I mean, I'm asking perhaps to refer intuition for the result Larry presented earlier. Why, but, but why is it better to ignore what you know, which is there, all of this doesn't imply a violation of conditionality. Why is it better to ignore it, which is at some level ignoring something you know. 
It's using so, the average the average value of something you, you know or the expected value, but when you know that it, what the actual value. Why does this help? Or I mean, is there a maybe it's I don't I don't know if there's, if it's a good question, but so I mean the, the fundamental motivator for using IPS approaches in my experience is that you can you can say look this is a unbiased estimator and it has some confidence interval. Um, so all the modifications corrupt that a little bit, but it's still sort of the proper, the basic property is that you have a, a highly convergent estimator with a, with a good confidence interval. And so that, that, that um, it's just incredibly useful in practice because you, you, can, you can go to people and say, look, it, the truth is somewhere around here. Um, and uh, to some extent, this involves ignoring some information. I think that's fair. But uh, I, the information which is ignored, I think, doesn't... The difference between actual impressions and expected impressions, for example, it's not very important in terms of lost information uh, here. Right? So you have the, the total number of impressions that were recorded in your logging policy. You have the number of impressions where you, you're evaluation policy happens to agree with the logging policy. These, these numbers differ, but because you know the probability of the actions, you can kind of, you can sort of uh, modify the expectation so that it's approximating what would happen if it was, if the data, if the policy was actually deployed at the logging time. And now there's some disagreement because, um, you know, the, uh, if you have an estimator, of what the actual number of uh, events is, it won't be perfectly accurate, but this is like one free variable with many samples. And so you're going to converge pretty quickly to get the right answer. Larry, is that, th is that the way you would put it? I imagine you're mostly in agreement. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think what John's saying, you know, basically he's saying, look, we have a simple accurate estimator. It's really easy to compute and it's accurate. That's the justification for it is, is it, it's, it's not it, a well, I mean, I, it, it actually is pretty high variance, but, but maybe we uh, could put that as well. Well, in its simplest form, right, if the propensity scores get small, it, it can be high variance. But then, as it's John a, pointed out, there's many versions of this, and there's the doubly robust version. You know, there's, there's you don't have to use the simplest. So, just for the sake of discussion, I guess we're talking about the Horowitz Thompson version, but. Okay, I, I, but it, it, doubly robust is bringing a model and maybe sort of stepping that direction anyway. Um, uh, and it's, it, it's really looking for exact coincidences. Uh, uh, Philip, you're, you're gonna defend likelihood in this context or not? Um, I'm a little bit uh, out of my depth here because I'm, uh, I'm not into recommender systems and uh, clicks and... Uh, uh, we can we can uh, rephrase in terms of aspirin, but I don't. I might lose it. Yeah, I'm more that, that would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, personalized medicine—it's like what we imagine we're doing, but we're actually delivering recommendations. Um, uh, any last comments, uh, Carlos Finn? Um. Well, uh, I guess, well, we do, like, I guess from the presentations, we saw that we need new notation, maybe Philip saying that we don't, but uh, maybe he thinks it's not, it's mild, the notation, uh, but, but it's, but we do need to, to have something to represent different regimes, right? Uh, and we need, and we need how to systematically handle these types of assumptions. Um, so, so we can do causal inference mathematically as we do other things. This reminds me of the XB comic where, like, they say, "Oh, we need everyone. We need a new standard. So maybe we should come up with, with our new new notation that only only we use." No, eventually it's gonna settle. Uh, but the but the but the will the be. main the main lesson is, I think, is that at least that I wanted you everyone, I guess, to see is that causal inference and Bayesian inference are orthogonal, but, it's, but in the sense that it's good, in the sense that Bayesian inference can benefit from causal inference, 
from the tools of causal inference, let's say, uh, to uh, handle causal questions uh, better. Like, just like doing posterior predictive checks, you have a debugger, analytical debugger for your models, right? That you can derive the logical implications of your models and you can use that to, to write better models or to, to understand whether you can get what you want from your model. Uh, even if you're doing numerical things, even if you're getting a posterior numerically, like sampling directly from the intervention distribution, you understand exactly what you're doing. Uh, and, and, and I think now that the Bayesians are getting more interested in causal inference, uh, I think it's have some, gonna have some cross-pollination in terms of, uh, I think some of these causal inference concepts will, will uh, like defining the query non-parametrically, I think this will be more pervasive in the okay. Bayesian no sense. Finn, would you wanna have, we need to wrap up. Do you wanna have the last word? Uh... Uh, I mean, I think a lot of the debate here has, has just been about semantics. I absolutely agree that the do calculus and the whole conditional independence and non-parametric um, modeling is a super useful tool for figuring out when you can just write an expression for as long as you can model your causal process as a DAG, then you can jump straight to an expression that's in terms of the data that you have. And then you can just estimate that whether with a frequentist estimator or a Bayesian estimator, it really doesn't matter. Um, but I don't think that we fundamentally require anything, you know, new notation can be helpful in terms of, of uh, making it shorter to write something down, but there's a whole lot of inference problems that require jumping across different distributions or making different assumptions. So I guess I don't see causal inference as, as necessarily quite as special or different as it's sometimes made up to be. Okay. I, I'm sure there are many people that we want to push back against this, but we really need to close it off. Uh, thanks all for, uh, for your time. It's a great pleasure to have you. I hope we've got past semantics a little bit to something a little bit deeper. And uh, really, we really appreciate your thoughts. And again, I, I hate the way we clap in this virtual world, but thank you. Um, uh, and uh, I hope you had some fun and uh, I'm sure, sorry we can't go to the pub afterwards. Anyway, I, I, I do need to stop because uh, uh, the next speaker needs to start, but, but thanks again. Well, thank thanks you for, for inviting. Yeah, uh, it was great. Yes, thanks.